would like to thank Dr. Mettler for that introduction. She and I are both interested in gynecologic surgery, and we're both interested in the subject of hysterectomy. And I will tell you that she has a book on hysterectomy that will be coming out very soon. Uh, so uh, please think about that if you're interested in reading more about hysterectomy. Uh, I'm from Chicago, and uh, I would like to just show you a picture of downtown Chicago where our medical school is located. And this is the um, Northwestern Women's Hospital in downtown Chicago. Uh, I have uh, four or five objectives for this lecture that I would like to share with you. The first one is to appreciate the role of hysterectomy in practice because it's a very common operation, as you all know. Secondly, to appreciate how alternatives have decreased the hysterectomies in the United States. Thirdly, to understand the effectiveness of available alternatives based on the evidence in the literature. Next, to be aware of new surgical and medical therapies. And finally, to know how to appropriately counsel patients regarding hysterectomy and alternatives. We do 450,000 hysterectomies in the United States uh, at the present time per year, and one in three women by age 60 in our country has had a hysterectomy. So we have a high rate of hysterectomy, 5.4 per 1,000 women per year, higher than Italy, which is about 3.5, and the, the lowest in the uh, European area is Norway, with about one hysterectomy per 1,000 women per year. Uh, I mentioned that we do 450,000 hysterectomies in our country. In Italy, the best number I could find was 126,000, and you can see the numbers for some of the other countries uh, in Europe. Now, hysterectomy in the United States is on the decline. We had a high number of 700,000 back in 2002, and since then the number has been going down, and in 2010 we were down to the number that I quoted to you. And the reason for this decline is in part due to the alternatives that I'm going to talk with you today. Now, uh, one of the issues that always comes up when we talk about hysterectomy is the root of hysterectomy for benign disease. And um, as you can see from this American College opinion, evidence demonstrates that in general, vaginal hysterectomy is associated with better outcomes, fewer complications than laparoscopic or abdominal hysterectomy, and other uh, organizations have come to the same uh, conclusion. Now, you can see uh, that despite that, the majority of hysterectomies in the United States are still abdominal. There has been a slight increase in laparoscopic and robotic hysterectomies, but well, we're still doing a lot of abdominal hysterectomies, and I think this is true in Europe also. So why should we be interested in alternatives to hysterectomy? And there are two main reasons. One, there are many new medical and surgical procedures that we have available today that are reasonably effective and widely accepted by patients. The second, and this may be more true in uh, industrialized countries, but the public is asking for alternatives to traditional abdominal surgery. The American Medical Association has said that all patients have a right to choose among available alternatives, and this is particularly true in terms of surgical procedures. Now, most of the hysterectomies for benign disease are done for fibroids or for abnormal bleeding, so the things I will talk about today relate to these two uh, conditions. The subjects that I'm going to cover are myomectomy, uterine artery embolization, MRI-guided focused ultrasound, endometrial ablation, uh, the levonorgestrel IUD, 
and mention some new surgical and medical therapies and some research in the field of fibroids. Uh, myomectomy became popular about 1995 to preserve the uterus and to preserve fertility. And uh, for young women, the important consideration is that there's always an increased possibility of uterine rupture during pregnancy or even vaginal delivery. Now, whether it's an abdominal or a laparoscopic myomectomy, there are certain things that are common and are important. There's a recurrence rate of at least 20%. There's a reoperation rate of at least 10% within five years. When while the conversion to hysterectomy uh, is less than 1% in most studies, the morbidity is equal to hysterectomy. And in uh, our country, we have another consideration, and that's the morcellation issue, and I'll discuss that in just a moment. Now, there's an interesting and nice paper by Dr. Sizzi from Rome uh, that was published recently, uh, and it's the Italian multicenter study on complications of laparoscopic myomectomy. Over 2,000 patients from four centers, and there were only 2% of major complications, uh, including readmissions to the hospital. So uh, she and her co-authors came to the conclusion that uh, laparoscopic myomectomy is indeed a safe technique with an extremely low failure rate and good results. And I think other people have come to similar conclusions. Now, the morcellation issue is complicated uh, because uh, of leiomyosarcoma. And while we're, uh, we know that leiomyosarcoma does occur, we do not know the incidence of leiomyosarcoma in patients that appear to have a fibroid uterus. It could be as low as 1 in 330. I don't believe that. It's probably closer to 1 in 5,000. Unfortunately, there's no good preoperative technique to differentiate benign disease from leiomyosarcoma. Uh, and the MRI procedure, while sensitive, is not very specific. And most recently, we're doing contained tissue extraction, which we call bag morcellation. Uh, however, there's no evidence that this is any safer as far as the patient is concerned. Uh, and this is the uh, uh, concern that was introduced into the United States in 2014 by the, the USA Food and Drug Administration. They first issued a, a statement discouraging the use of power morcellation. Later on, they sent a warning out uh, about the use of power morcellation. However, they didn't prohibit the use of power morcellation. Therefore, uh, we still today have to rely on surgical judgment and appropriate informed consent because I think it's really a, a good and helpful procedure. But what has happened uh, in uh, the U.S. since the uh, warning has come out is that abdominal hysterectomy has increased about 4% and vaginal and laparoscopic hysterectomy have decreased each about 2%. So there has been a change in behavior as a result of the Food and Drug Administration concerns. Now, you know, this is a picture, as you all recognize, of a simple submucous fibroid. And uh, patients like this are treated with hysteroscopic myomectomy. Uh, it's an established procedure now. It's extremely effective for both submucous and for some intramural fibroids. And relatively few complications have been reported except for fluid overload. And today we have some new um, hysteroscopic uh, morcellators that are available that make the procedure go more quickly. So I'm not going to say anything more about hysteroscopic um, uh, of myomectomy, uh, but I will show you some research uh, that relates to this technique uh, toward the end of my talk. Uterine artery embolization has also been with us since the mid-1990s, and it can be completed most of the time. Uh, the main indication when it was introduced was heavy menstrual bleeding, and that, in my opinion, is still 
the main indication for uterine artery embolization. Uh, it reduces the size of the fibroids. In some cases, it reduces the size of the uterus. Uh, and the complications are few, but occasionally they're serious. Uh, we wanted to look at complications from uterine artery embolization. So we, we started this fibroid registry in the United States uh, back about 10 years ago and enlisted 27 academic centers to contribute their patients uh, that we could follow for three years. Uh, we had a list of 2,112 patients. Uh, we interviewed all of these patients three years after the embolization to see what the complication rate would be. And about 10% of the patients came to hysterectomy. About 3% came to operative myomectomy. And 2% had a repeat uh, embolization. So in counseling patients, you can say that on the basis of the reported evidence, embolization is 90% effective in uh, 10 years. Now, MRI-guided focused ultrasound is a newer procedure uh, that is being used in some centers. And uh, this is uh, focused ultrasound, which, as you see from this uh, picture, uh, heats the fibroid and, uh, by uh, increasing the temperature, uh, does tissue destruction. And the, the use of um, the uh, MRI to guide the ultrasound is very important, but also the new technology allows for the temperature to be measured with each uh, pulse, and therefore there is minimal uh, injury to surrounding structures because it's focused exactly on the fibroid. The treatment takes a long time, up to three hours, but it is an outpatient procedure. And uh, there is very little discomfort with this procedure versus embolization because it's coagulative necrosis and not ischemic necrosis. In other words, we're not occluding the blood supply, just coagulating the fibroid. And here's a picture of a scan before and after, and you can see after uh, the, the treatment there's no blood flow at all in the fibroid. This was uh, approved for use in the United States in 2004. Uh, several thousand patients have been treated, uh, and about 80% of the patients report improvement. So this is a technique that's perhaps 80% effective. Another procedure that has become common uh, for the uh, patient with heavy menstrual bleeding that has a normal size uterus is endometrial ablation. Uh, 15 to 20 years ago, we did most of the ablations with a resectoscope. Since about 2000, uh, there have been a whole group of second-generation procedures that have been introduced, and they're all similarly effective. Uh, and the nice thing is that many of them can be done on an ambulatory basis. Now, here are two points for endometrial ablation that I'd like to uh, share with you. Uh, the techniques that we have available now are extremely effective in controlling abnormal bleeding, especially in women who have failed medical management and who have completed childbearing. So we know the techniques are effective. Secondly, reduction of menstrual flow is adequate symptom control, and achievement of amenorrhea, as we used to aim for, uh, is not any longer considered important. Here are the statistics from our own hospital uh, with the Novasure advice. And you can see here that 80% uh, of the patients develop normal menstrual flow following treatment, and 90% of the patients uh, were satisfied. So this is a, a good technique for selected patients, usually uh, patients in their 40s. This is a graph from the National Health Service in Great Britain where they started using endometrial ablation in 89 up to 2004. And as the number of endometrial ablations went up, the number of hysterectomies came down, just as you would expect. And the same thing is true in the United States. Here are some figures for patients with abnormal uterine bleeding uh, and you can see the number of hysterectomies going down over this uh, period of time from 2002 to 2009 uh, due to uh, the wide use of endometrial ablation. 
Um, our country, ACOG, issues recommendations uh, for physicians, and here are the two relating to endometrial ablation, that patients who choose endometrial ablation should be willing to accept normalization of menstrual flow, not necessarily amenorrhea, as I mentioned to you a moment ago. And secondly, and this is very important, the hysterectomy rates associated with endometrial ablation are at least 24% within four years following the procedure. So in general, we can say that endometrial ablation is about 75% uh, effective in uh, avoiding a hysterectomy. Now, there have been many medical alternatives over the years, uh, but the only one I think that's important today is the levonorgestrel intrauterine device. And as you know, it was originally introduced as a long-acting contraceptive, uh, but subsequently it's proved to be very useful in the management of patients with abnormal uterine bleeding because of the direct progestational effect on the endometrium. And the important concern is that if you're going to use the IUD for the control of abnormal uterine bleeding, you should make every effort to be sure that the pathology uh, is uh, normal and that you're not going to be treating a malignancy. That's another whole topic, but in general, we would like to have the endometrial pathology to be normal before putting in uh, an IUD. Now, there have been many studies, but here's one uh, that I think is a nice study because it was done by a single doctor uh, in his office uh, where he had 92 women, uh, and he followed them for three years uh, with the levonorgestrel IUD. And 94%, 94% of these patients were successfully treated. In other words, their bleeding uh, was corrected. Six of his patients required hysterectomy. So again, this is one of the things that you can quote if you're asking or patients are asking what is the effectiveness of the levonorgestrel IUD in avoiding a hysterectomy. It's probably 90% or more. So uh, in selected patients, uh, this is an important figure. Now, we've talked about the the things at the top of this slide. I'd like to spend some time uh, talking about uh, what I call new surgical and medical therapies and uh, some of the research that is going on in this field. The first procedure that I think is uh, important uh, is one that was introduced about two years ago in the United States and Canada called the ASESA system. It's basically laparoscopic radiofrequency ablation. Now, the first step in this procedure is to introduce an ultrasound probe laparoscopically. And when you do that, you can map out the fibroid very accurately, much more accurately than you can do with transabdominal or transvaginal ultrasound. The second step, percutaneously, is putting in the electrode into the fibroid directly. And the third step is the electrocoagulation of the fibroid. Of course, each fibroid has to be treated individually when you do this. But in the initial study, uh, there were up to seven or eight fibroids that were treated uh, under one operative uh, procedure. Now, the... uh, initial study that was presented to the FDA for approval showed that 80%, 81% of the patients uh, experienced a reduction in bleeding at 12 months, and all of these patients are patients that had heavy menstrual bleeding. The change in uterine volume was 44%, and the quality of life score uh, was increased uh, quite markedly from 37 to 80% at 24 months. These patients were again followed for another year, and here's the 36-month report. In other words, a three-year outcome study. Uh, Oh, by the way, the technique now goes by the name of volumetric thermal ablation, RFVTA of myomas, Uh, but it's still the assessor technique. 
And uh, of these 104 patients that were available for study at the end of 36 months, uh, we had a success rate of 90%. So that, again, this is proven to be a, a a good procedure uh, done laparoscopically uh, for fibroids. A similar procedure is now under investigation for uh, intrauterine use, and this is called the Sonesta system, and it's uh, sonography-guided transcervical ablation of uterine fibroids. The Sonata system includes a high-resolution, ultra-compact sonography probe at the tip of a radio frequency ablation device. So just a single device that's like inserted into the uterus, like a hysteroscope, uh, and the fibroids can be identified and can be treated as long as they are within the uterus, like you see here with fibroid number one, or if they're submucous, like fibroid number two, or even intramural fibroids, like three, four, and five, can be treated with this system. It's not on the market yet. It's under evaluation, but uh, it looks like it's going to be a very nice addition for the treatment of uh, intrauterine uh, myomas. Now, uh, what about medical therapies? There's a lot of interest in medical therapies for fibroids by pharmaceutical companies because it's a huge, huge audience if they can come up with uh, good pharmaceuticals. Uh, the two that are most promising are the progesterone receptor modulators and Elagolix, and I'll just tell you briefly uh, the evidence for each of these. Uh, the, a best progesterone receptor modulator is ulipristal acetate. It was developed at the National Institutes of Health in the United States, uh, but it was licensed to a European company uh, who brought it out on the market under the name, uh, well, you, I think you all know it. Um, and uh, the basis for uh, marketing was this trial that was presented at ESHRI in 2011. Uh, where they showed uh, for the first time that one could get a marked reduction in fibroid size uh, with uh, no appreciable side effects, uh, including uh, concerns about the endometrium due to unopposed estrogen uh, production. Now, the Im important paper for ESMA is this one published by Jacques Donnet in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2012. Eulopristal acetate versus placebo for fibroid treatment before surgery. And this is a very elegant study where uh, they had three groups of patients. All of the patients were anemic. Ninety-six patients were in the low-dose group and treated for 13 weeks. Ninety-eight patients were in the higher-dose group treated for 13 weeks. And then there were 48 patients in a placebo group that simply received iron therapy. Well, they all received iron therapy. But the dramatic thing was within seven days, most of the patients in the treatment group uh, groups uh, stopped bleeding. And by the end of the 13 weeks, virtually all of the patients, as you see here, stopped bleeding, whereas the placebo group, did not do much, except they gained a little bit due to the iron uh, therapy. And here are the exact figures from the paper. The uterine bleeding was controlled in 91% of the patients in the low-dose group and 92% of the patients in the high-dose group versus 19% in the control group. So you don't even need statistics to analyze these figures. Uh, as far as amenorrhea is concerned, 73% uh, of the patients in the low-dose group developed amenorrhea and 82% in the high-dose group developed amenorrhea within 10 days of the initiation of therapy. And importantly, 
there was a significant and sustained reduction in fibroid volume. And the endometrial changes that occurred, and there will always be endometrial changes uh, as long as there's estrogen available, uh, resolved in six months after the end of therapy. So this is an important paper. At the Fiegel Congress in Rome in 2012, there was a symposium on uh, this topic, and uh, the conclusion was that ulipristal acetate can be considered as an additional evidence-based option for the treatment of uterine fibroids. So I share that with you. Now, there's another preparation on the, that is being studied in the United States, uh, Elagolix, which is uh, being used for the treatment of fibroids. Elagolix is a novel, orally administered gonadotropin-releasing hormone antagonist. So it's orally administered, and it's a GnRH antagonist. It suppresses FSH and LH, and it's now undergoing clinical trials. Here's one of the papers that just came out in fertility and sterility, um, Elagolics for the Management of Heavy Menstrual Bleeding Associated with Uterine Fibroids, results from a Phase 2A proof-of-concept study. And here are the graphs, and you can see this is the treatment group here, and uh, about 80 to 90 percent of the patients had a uh, positive response. Uh, uh, these patients have to be given ad back therapy because the FSH and LH are both uh, uh, suppressed. But it's another compound that is likely to be on the market soon. Now, what about research in this field? Uh, there are a lot of avenues of research. One is the fact that it's been found that some of the statin preparations have an effect uh, on leiomyoma cells in, in vitro uh, by causing cell death. And so there may be an opportunity for a statin-type preparation uh, that would be useful orally for uh, decreasing fibroids uh, in patients. That's number one. Number two, there are a lot of compounds now that are being evaluated that are expressed by fibroids. And this is one of them, erythropoietin. And so it may be possible to have an erythropoietin antagonist that could be used to slow the growth or to inhibit the growth of fibroids. Number two. Number three, uh, fibroids have stem cells. So uh, it is possible now uh, to develop adenoviruses that will have an effect on inhibiting uh, uterine stem cells. Now, this is a picture of uh, adenoviruses that are attached to magnetic nanoparticles that are focused in, in the uterus. So this is another possibility in terms of medical treatment of fibroids. Now, uh, we started the talk by saying hysterectomy uh, is very popular in the United States and in other countries, and I think it's still a very good operation. Many studies have shown that the quality of life of women increases substantially after hysterectomy for benign disease. And then, of course, what you all know, vaginal hysterectomy and laparoscopic hysterectomy are associated with an improved postoperative course over abdominal hysterectomy, and these are the favored routes of hysterectomy. What about ovarian removal at the time of hysterectomy? The American College now recommends that retaining normal ovaries at the time of hysterectomy for benign disease in premenopausal women who are not at increased risk for ovarian cancer. So most of the time now, uh, normal ovaries are left in place. What about the removal of the tubes at the time of hysterectomy? Uh, here's the American College Committee opinion. Prophylactic salpingectomy may offer clinicians the opportunity to prevent ovarian cancer in their patients, and a lot of uh, prophylactic salpingectomies are being done now, although there's no evidence uh, for that uh, statement. So what about alternatives to hysterectomy? Uh, first of all, while hysterectomy is 100% successful in treating benign uterine pathology, alternative methods are not 100%, and I've given you some of the percentages. Patient counseling is extremely important in discussing alternatives 
to hysterectomy with patients. Options should be presented on the basis of reported evidence, and patients should be involved in the decision-making process. I'm now going to show you a quote. For patients in their reproductive years who are considering hysterectomy for benign diseases, if all presently available alternatives are presented, at least 30% of all hysterectomies can be avoided. I don't know if you know who said this, but I said this. And I said this after analyzing in my own practice 10 years of experience. When I was chairman of the department at Northwestern, I saw a good many patients for second opinions, patients that had been told by uh, their surgeon that a hysterectomy was uh, uh, the best choice. And on about 60% of the time, I agreed uh, with uh, the previous consultation. And about 30, 35% of the time, uh, in my opinion, uh, and in the patient's opinion, an alternative uh, was uh, worth trying. So again, this is not evidence-based, it's experience-based. And uh, I, th- I think that you'll find that about one-third of your cases uh, can be treated with some uh, alternative today. Much of what I've told you is in the Global Library of Women's Medicine. Um, This is an Internet product that I uh, uh, used to edit. Uh, It's now the uh, FIGO educational platform. And if you go to Women's Medicine on the Global Library of uh, Women's Medicine, you'll find that there are 446 chapters Uh, that are authored by over 650 expert contributors with more than 40,000 references. It's www.glowm.com. It's continually updated. It's linked to PubMed and the FDA website. It contains a video library of surgical procedures and a video library of ultrasound procedures. contains some master class lectures some patient information brochures, and most importantly, it's available free, and there's no advertising because it's now the FIGO uh, educational portal. www.glowm.com, I recommend it to you. And I thank you for coming after lunch uh, for this uh, presentation, and I'd like to show you a picture of downtown Chicago at night with the moon over Lake Michigan. Uh, Thanks again for coming. (laughs) 